We live in a world that pushes the negativity to the forefront because it gets more eyeballs. The idea of positive things happening, we kind of dismiss that as delusional in our society. I think what you see a lot of is either people are playing the victim or you have these caricatures of motivational speakers saying to suck it up, people have it worse than you, it's not all that bad and just get on with it. And both of those extremes can come off as being toxic. Trust there are going to be plenty of people who are willing to spend their precious time debating about what's toxic and what's not toxic. We don't want to forget that negativity can also be a toxic experience. In fact, you could even make the argument that it's more toxic than forcing yourself to be more positive. From a spiritual perspective, everybody, no matter what your situation is, everybody's getting exactly what they need in order to grow and develop spiritually. In today's solo episode, I'm going to be exploring the topic of toxic positivity, which is one of the buzzwords today circulating around, particularly the wellness and, and the therapeutic communities. Um, I want to start though by sharing a story with you. And this is a, this is a very common story. You probably heard it before, but I just want to share the story as context for what, how I want to approach this topic of toxic positivity. And this is the story, the old classic story of the farmer and the horse. And so there was once a humble farmer who owned a bony plow horse. And one spring afternoon, the farmer's son happened to be um, tending to the stable and he accidentally left the gate open and the, the lone plow horse ran away. And upon hearing this news about the plow horse having escaped, the farmer's friends came over and they tried to console him. And they were saying things like, we're so sorry you no longer have your horse. What awful news. What bad luck. And the farmer's reply sur surprised them. He replied saying, you know, bad luck, good luck. Who knows? And then a few days later, the horse returns with a herd of wild stallions, which basically quadrupled the farmer's lot and all the neighbors heard about this and they came around. They were filled with, uh, with jubilation saying things like, this is, this is great news. You're so fortunate. Um, and the farmer whispers to his son, good news, bad news, who knows? And then the next day when the farmer's son was trying to ride one of the wild stallions, he was thrown to the ground and his leg broke. All the neighbors heard about it, came around. Oh no, that's horrible news. Such bad luck. The farmer thinks to himself, bad luck, good luck. Who really knows? And then a short time later, war broke out. And all of the young, able-bodied men in the village were drafted to fight in this war except for the farmer's son due to his broken leg. The neighbors came back around. Oh my God, what an amazing stroke of luck. <laughs> Good news, bad news, who knows? And so by today's standards, that farmer might have been accused of being toxically positive or of spiritually bypassing the terrible circumstances that he kept finding himself in. And that brings us to what I would like to explore in this solo episode, which is the idea of, of toxic positivity. Okay, so what is toxic positivity? It is 
It is described as the excessive and or the ineffective overgeneralization of a happy, uh, optimistic state across all situations. It, it tends to dismiss uh, the emotional experiences that are not positive, and it implies that people should maintain a positive mindset regardless of the emotional pain or challenging circumstances that they happen to be facing. And one of the reasons why I like this farmer and the plow horse story is because I think it's a really great example of what starts to happen when one begins practicing their inner work on a regular basis. You tend to move away from the extremes, right? Which is, hey, everything that happens is good. It's, it's on purpose. There's a reason for it and all of that. And you're saying it, but you haven't really gotten to the point where you're, you're truly embodying that yet. And so it can come off as being a bit condescending unintentionally, mostly, or the opposite side, which is, which is to kind of lean negative and to harp on the bad things that have happened and, you know, toe the line of, of victim consciousness. And I think that's what you see a lot of in the world today is either people are playing the victim or you have these sort of caricatures of motivational speakers saying to suck it up and people have it worse than you and you know it's not all that bad and just get 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 on with it and both of those extremes can come off as being a bit kind of toxic or a lot toxic right to people who are more so in the middle that is and, and there's a couple of things we need to understand, right? Most of these people who we come across who are toxically positive or toxically negative, um, we may be seeing their content on social media. And the thing with social media is that the way the algorithms are configured is it pushes the extreme point of view of anything to the search feed, to the for you pages. And so as we're just kind of mindlessly scrolling, we may tend to come across content that feels more extreme. And of course, the more of that stuff you come across, the more pressure you may personally feel to adjust your thinking to what um, the majority of those quote influencers are saying or how they're thinking about the world. And, and you may end up dismissing your own natural tendencies to kind of veer more towards the gray area, because here's what's never really happening in social media. The people who have the more nuanced point of views, the people who are able to see both sides of things, their content usually is not getting the same kind of traction as the people who are more so on the extreme side of things. The people who are, who are more nuanced, the people who have more considerations, their content, if you look at it, is mostly crickets, right? And again, this is a function of how it works because that's what humans are psychologically um, geared towards is to, uh, to be the, the observers of extremities. That's why when you look at the news, the quote news, I put it in quotes because oftentimes it's not really the full story of anything. It's the editors who, who write the news and who publish the news are looking for stories if it bleeds, it leads. They're looking for the most extreme stories, right? There's billions of things happening on a daily basis, 
that are positive, that are nuanced, and that have maybe a little bit of both positive and negative aspects, but that stuff doesn't sell. And when you remember that news organizations are private companies, which means their bottom line, their main focus is not to report the news. Their main focus is to provide a profit for their shareholders. If you are a private company, then that is your main focus. And everything that you do as a company is in service to that particular goal, right? Because if you weren't focusing on the goal of profit, then you wouldn't have a company to report the news. So you have to pay your reporters, you have to pay your rent, you have to pay for the engineers and whoever else is involved in publishing the, um, the media, whether it's print, magazine, online, whatever it is, right? There's a whole infrastructure that is required in order to publish that on a regular basis. And all of those people who work on that infrastructure have salaries and pensions and all kinds of things. So there needs to be money coming in and ideally more money coming in than the money that's going out. So on top of of sourcing news to report, you they need to run advertising and they need to come up with clever ways to run advertising so that the people who are consuming the news on their particular platform don't feel like they're just watching ad after ad after ad, but they feel like for the most part, they're able to just see the news. And if they happen to click on an ad or see an ad that, that falls into alignment with what they're looking for, then that's icing on the cake, right? So the user experience is also something that needs to be considered by these media organizations. But at the end of the day, in order to get eyeballs on the news so that they can potentially click on those ads, the headlines need to be somewhat sensationalized. And you learn this whenever you are personally promoting something and maybe you hire a public relations person, right? I did this when I wrote my, my first published book, Bliss More, How to Succeed in Meditation Without Really Trying. I hired a publicist and the publicist's job is to write these press releases and to distribute the press releases to the media, right? Obviously, as an author, you want to get your book, you know, reviewed in, in journals like the New York Times or the Times of London or the Wall Street Journal or these kinds of major media publications. So you can imagine that these publications are getting hit up by, you know, potentially, I don't know, thousands of authors a week, maybe millions of authors a year. And so their editors naturally are a lot more discerning than the editors at the, the Montgomery advertiser in Alabama or some little, you know, hokey doke newspaper in, in South Carolina or somewhere like a much smaller market where maybe they're getting tens or maybe a hundred authors every couple of months looking to uh, get their books written up in the newspaper. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions and look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below, and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. And so those New York Times editors, what they're looking for are the books that are going to produce headlines that get a lot of clicks. So there's got to be something really compelling. And if your book is just teaching people how to meditate, it's not really as compelling as somebody doing a tell-all book on a politician, right? So you have you have uh, Robert Kennedy Jr.'s sister trying to get people not to vote for him. Now that's interesting to a an editor in a magazine, right? And if she has, I don't I have no idea if she has a book out or not. I wouldn't be surprised if she did because she could get a book deal in two seconds as somebody from the Kennedy family who is openly 
uh, against her brother running for president for whatever reasons she thinks are important, that a publisher will look at that and go, oh my God, we can sell so many books, right? No one's asking, hey, are you a good writer? No one cares, you know, if she has read a bunch of other books and, you know, or none of that really matters. What matters is that she has a very sensationalized angle. And so if she were to write that book and then reach out to the New York Times and say, oh, this book on Against My Brother is coming out in two weeks, that that's going to shoot right to the top of the list for the New York Times editor. And they're going to be like, oh, my God. We're going to run that for sure because they're going to get a lot more clicks. Therefore, their advertisers are going to be happier. You know, they're going to make their money to pay the editors, pay the reporters and et cetera, et cetera. And that's just kind of how it works. Right. And that's the world that we live in. That's the world we live in a world that pushes the negativity to the to the forefront because it just gets more eyeballs. There is no publication on the same scale as a New York Times, as a Washington Post, that's only about positive things that that happen. And so because we operate in these extremes, naturally, you're going to get some people who feel like, well, you know, I want to do the opposite. I'm a I'm a negativity contrarian. So I'm always going to point out what's positive about something. And I think that's where this term toxic positivity started to come from is because you have the extreme positive point of view, which also makes it to the, the top of the, the algorithm, leaving behind the people who are, who are, you know, experiencing a little bit of both or able to articulate a little bit of both, not, not a hundred percent of the time, it may be one or two people that kind of break through, but for the most part, those kinds of opinions or those kinds of, of commentaries are getting screened out by the social media or the the, the news media um, algorithms, because that's just not what we're clicking on. That's not what we're clicking on. We're clicking on all the sensational stuff. What we also don't want to forget is that the negativity, the content that is focused more on the negative, and even when we go through some experience that causes us to be more negative, we don't want to forget that negativity can also be a toxic experience. In fact, you could even make the argument that it's more toxic of an experience than, than forcing yourself to be a little bit more positive about it. And that's from a psychophysiological um, perspective right? Because negativity implies that to some degree, you're experiencing distress. Distress means you're experiencing fear. It means you're experiencing maybe sadness or anger, or even things like boredom are considered to be distressful. And what the body does when it's, it's being, how the body responds to distressful emotions is it releases very toxic chemicals in the nervous system. And this is what initiates what they call the fight flight reaction, which is where the body uh, interprets fear, sadness, anger, as you are under attack by a predator that's trying to kill you. So the stakes are extremely high under the influence of those, those stress chemicals, the fight or flight reaction. And so automatically within, you know, a split second, everything in your body starts to get rearranged. The priorities change from whatever the long-term survival functions happen to be, such as reproduction, hormonal balancing, digestion of food, et cetera. And everything gets rerouted to, um, preparing the body for battle. And those priorities are very, very good if indeed you are having, having to fight a bear off or you're having to climb a tree to escape from something or you're having to run into a burning building and rescue some, someone, right? 
but it's only meant to be temporary. It's only meant to be temporary, which means after the, the stressful incident is over, then the body needs to revert back to the long-term survival functions in order for you to continue living your life and thriving while you're doing so. Otherwise, if you find yourself in negative situation after negative situation and you're interpreting it as a fight flight um, circumstance, then over time, what will happen is your body will start to hardwire itself to stay more or less in the fight flight reaction, which causes you to have experiences of, of low grade anxiety, bouts of depression or other sorts of mental health challenges. So a mental health challenge, for the most part, there may be some exceptions to this, but for the most part, a mental health challenge is the byproduct of a nervous system that has been exposed to um, more stress than, than homeostasis, than balance uh, over the course of the lifetime. And at one point, the body said, the body, which has its own algorithm, said, you know what? It's way more effective to just lock this into place than it is to keep going out of the stress reaction and coming back into the fight flight and coming out and then coming back in. Evidently, because there is a there is a moment of fear, anxiety, or or anger happening on a fairly regular basis, maybe every few hours then evidently we live in an environment that where we're always vulnerable to it being attacked. And so let's just stay in the fight flight reaction. And once you stay in now you're starting to experience more symptoms that are associated with the fight flight reaction. And I don't want to get into all of that because that's a whole other conversation, but you can Google fight flight reaction symptoms. Just Google that fight flight symptoms. And go to any one of those pages on any one of those links on the first page. And you'll probably see, I don't know, 100, maybe 200, maybe more symptoms of what all happens in the body under the influence of stress when you're in the fight flight mode. And I'll guarantee you that any weird, inexplicable symptom that you may have experienced in the past, or maybe you know someone who's experiencing now, everything from dry skin to blotches to hair falling out to um, an inability to you know produce saliva, like all these little weird things that most most of the time the doctors don't have an explanation for. They are on that list of fight flight symptoms. And it becomes pretty apparent when you are operating under the influence of stress that physiologically speaking, things do not go very well. And that's not a situation that anybody wants to find themselves in. And so coming back to toxic positivity, right? We call that toxic because it invalidates people's one-sided experience, which is that when I'm having a bad life experience, my version of the horse ran away or my version of my son fell and broke his leg or my version of um, there's a war that just broke out. When we're having our one-sided experience, now, from a spiritual perspective, the opportunity there is to not invalidate that part of the experience, but to expand our perspective to, well, maybe there's other things that are also happening at the same time, right? And that's where you get these concepts that we're all familiar with, like karma, like dharma, like this idea of a life purpose, like the idea that everything is happening um, for a reason, you know, these kinds of concepts that you hear a lot and read a lot about in spiritual books. And it's easy to dismiss them when you haven't 
been exposed to very many spiritual practices, right? In other words, you're just sort of intellectualizing these ideas. And the moment life gets, quote, real, right? In other words, something bad happens. That's what we call real life is bad stuff. And the idea of positive things happening, we, we kind of dismiss that as delusional in our society. If you were to start a business and you were to focus on all the wonderful things that were going to happen in, in and around your business over the next few years, people would dismiss you as delusional, right? If you went to go get uh, a loan for your business and they sat you down in the bank and they said, okay, tell me, how do you plan to make the money? And da, 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 da. And you, you lay out the whole plan and it's all just positive thing after positive thing after positive thing. They'll go, you know, tell us what are some of the bad things that can happen? And if you said, well, there is no bad that's going to happen. That's, yeah. I believe that, you know, we're going to experience this. I'm putting my focus on that. It's the law of attraction. Haven't you heard of the law? They would laugh you out of that bank. You would not get that loan because you wouldn't be considered a realistic individual. And, uh, and so again, that's an extreme example. We're indoctrinated to come into the loan officer's office and lay out the whole quotes, realistic plan. You know, this is probably not going to happen. I've already counted for that. I have these stop gaps in place. I have these guardrails in place. In other words, your whole plan is catered to the worst case scenario because that's what the bank ultimately wants to see. They want to see in the worst case scenario, am I still going to make my loan back? Are you still going to be able to make your loan payments? And if so, I'll give you the loan. They're not interested in the best case scenario. And so again, you know, when we talk about inner work and, and practices like meditation, practices like gratitude, practices like being of service, you know, random acts of kindness, stuff like that. It's interesting because when you engage in those kinds of practices and you do that on a regular basis, what starts happening is you begin to produce the hormones that the body is not experiencing under the influence of stress. What stress is, is it is the absence of serotonin and dopamine and other feel-good uh, hormones. And it is the presence of stress hormones. So you've heard of adrenaline, you've heard of cortisol and these kinds of hormones. That's what puts the body into the fight flight reaction. So in order for that to become very effective, it has to also block any of the serotonin and the dopamine and the oxytocin and those kind of feel good hormones that makes you want to go and hug something. And instead those stress hormones, uh, make you want to run away from something and or fight something or become confrontational. So what the meditation and the gratitude and all those other inner work practices do is that they, they reintroduce the serotonin and the dopamine and the oxytocin, which then makes you want to feel connected to something and it makes you want to go and hug something and it makes you want to see the bright side of something. And, but it also doesn't deny whatever else is happening in and around you. And so just taking it one layer deeper than toxic positivity or toxic negativity is we want to start to look at it in terms of pain and suffering. Because what people typically label as a negative experience is an experience where they are suffering. It's an experience where they are suffering, right? So for instance, you have a toothache, okay? Let's say you, you have a cookie fetish and you just love eating cookies and you eat cookies all day long, but you don't floss your teeth properly. And let's say you don't brush your teeth effectively. And so, and your teeth are susceptible to, you know, the sugar, the refined sugar content that you may eat in food. Some people's teeth are very strong and resilient. My teeth are not that way. I have a, my brother, my brother, uh, my older brother has never had a cavity. He drinks soda. He eats sweets, you know, all day, all day long. 
never had a cavity. I don't even know if he flosses, to be honest with you. Myself, on the other hand, I can just look at a, a cookie and I'll start feeling like I'm getting a cavity. If I just look at something that's sweet and I have to floss and I have to brush, you know, and, and just go above and beyond to take care of my teeth. And I've had literally every dental procedure you can imagine over the decades that I've been alive. So, but in any case, if someone gets cavities and, and it comes out that they've been eating cookies all the time, right? No dentist is going to be surprised by that happening. And if they start to feel sorry for themselves because they have a cavity, right? And create this whole story around what it means to have cavities and you're such a bad person and oh my God and blah, blah, blah. They're adding a layer of pain on top of the pain that they already may be feeling um, with the cavity itself. And so what you obviously want to do is go get the cavity fixed, but also you may want to put some more attention onto your protocols, your eating protocols, your teeth, your tooth care protocols, and see if you can clean that up. And if you focus more on what you can do as opposed to what's not happening, which is I'm not pain-free right now, then you can actually minimize the suffering, if not eliminate it altogether, because your focus, your focus is on what you can do and what's possible. Okay. So again, some people may, may relate to that approach to whatever suffering you're experiencing in life as toxic positivity, where, where they're being reminded, Hey, this didn't just come out of the thin blue sky. This happened because it's connected to other things that are either happening or not happening in your experience. And it's not to deny that the cavity is painful, but the cavity came from somewhere and there's something that you can do about that. So, so I think, you know, what, what a, a helpful protocol would be as someone on the other side of listening to someone complaining about their experience is you always have to start with validating the other person's pain and or suffering. You have to validate that, right? Even Gandhi said a message that isn't delivered with love is not going to be received. It's going to be rejected every single time. And that's that comes just from being spiritually mature. Spiritual maturity is when someone who has a spiritual practice is able to embody the the attributes of that practice in such a way that they can they can hold multiple truths in their awareness at the same time. So there's the so-called positive aspect of the experience, which is, hey, there's something we can do about this. And there are other things that have led to this that we can change as well. And it's the acknowledgement and or the awareness that something or someone is suffering, right? And there's a reason why that suffering is happening. And the awareness that, hey, maybe now is not the time and the place to get into why the suffering is happening. Maybe now is the time or place just to listen. Maybe now is the time or place to ask questions. Maybe now is the time or place to get permission to offer any feedback. And so when you bring all of that into the discussion, then you can, you will be, you will be honoring that other person's experience. You'll be validating their experience. And then you'll have a, 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 an ear that's more attuned to hearing whatever else you have to say that may be considered uh, positive or, or more positive than someone is willing to, to hear in that moment. And so that's our opportunity. And, and that, that, can't be an ex it, it, that can't be an intellectual exercise. It can't be something, oh, I read it in a book and I'm applying it now. It's got to be something that is embodied. And what that means to embody it is you are able to empathize with the other person's experience because you've been where they are. 
you've been someone who has also experienced pain and suffering and someone has come in and, and tried to fix you by just giving you information that they themselves have not embodied. And what do we do in that case? We start looking for evidence to demonstrate that this person who's trying to fix me is a hypocrite. That's what we do. You know, why are you telling me to do this when you haven't done it yourself? That's where we go with it. It's not about whether what they're saying is valid or invalid. It's just that naturally, if we feel like someone's trying to just come in, swoop in and fix us, we, we start looking for reasons why they don't know what they're talking about and how they've been out of integrity with the things that they're saying. Whereas when we're being empathetic, the way in which we're presenting the information or the solution is, is sort of wrapped in this, this ability to relate to one's experience. You know, I've been there before and, uh, and I know how hard it is. I know how painful it is. And then shut up and just listen, right? Yes, yes, yes. It's so difficult. Oh my God, I don't know if I can do X, Y, and Z and blah, blah, blah. And so again, the, the more immature, impatient um, person is wanting to get to the point where they offer the solution. They know what the problem is. They offer the solution. And, and in their mind, the other person is going to be fixed. And if you're having a conversation and you're engaging with that sort of outcome oriented thinking in mind, again, it's not going to go well. It's not going to end well. You will be accused of being toxically positive, perhaps. And, um, and obviously that's not what you want because that's counterproductive to your, your true aim, which may be just to be friendly or to be supportive with this person who obviously you care enough about to even listen to what they have going on and to offer that solution. And so it takes a lot of, of, of spiritual discipline <laughs> to sit there and to be more process oriented and to understand that, Hey, this is a, this is going to be a dialogue. This is not just going to be a single conversation where we're going to arrive at the solution today or in five minutes. This may require a series of conversations where I am artfully allowing this person to arrive at the solution for themselves, which is always really the best way to find a solution for whatever we're going through is to feel like it's our idea. This is our idea, or it aligns with where we were going with it anyway. And in order to do that, you know, you may just offer prompts. You may just ask questions. Um, you may ask the other person to consider things that maybe they haven't considered. And if they have, maybe you ask for permission to explore other areas that may they may find helpful. And I have this one friend of mine who comes to me often to talk about things they're going through. And I will give my perspective on these things, which I obviously think, you know, it's a pretty helpful perspective. I try not to fix people's situation. I try to follow my own advice and just ask questions. But at the end of the day, she rarely takes my suggestions. But what will happen is she'll go and ask other people in her life. And those other people will give her similar type of feedback to the one that I gave her. And after they give her that feedback, then she'll make the connection with, oh, this is something that I think I should seriously consider and explore. And she'll come back to me and say, guess what What I'm, I've decided to do? I've decided to do ABC. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I, I kind of told you that's the best course of action based on what you said you want your goals were. But she won't give me the credit for it. She doesn't give me the credit for it. She says, oh, I talked to so-and-so and this is what they said and this is what makes the most sense. <laughs> and initially, because I'm a human being, it would be frustrating and I want to say things like I told you so and 
I can't pretend like I've been perfect in that. Sometimes I have said, you know, I, that's what I suggested to you as well. But for whatever reason, she, when she hears it from me, it's not enough for her to say, okay, that's what makes the most sense. She has to hear it from two or three other people. So I've realized that, oh, her coming to me is just one body of evidence. And she needs two or three different bodies of evidence in order to make the decision, right? And the person who gives her the solution first is not going to be the one to get the credit for the solution. So again, talk about spiritual maturity, the ability to hold multiple truths in your awareness at the same time. So holding the truth that I'm being helpful and the truth that she needs to come up with the solution on her own, those two truths on the surface can sort of negate one another and it could put me into either or an either or mentality. But if you can hold those two, two truths in your awareness or multiple truths in your awareness at the same time, it, it's fine. She got the solution. It aligned with what I also felt, right? And I didn't get credit for it. And, it, and that's all fine because at the end of the day, guess what? It's her life. It's not my life. And everyone has to do what they feel is best for them to do in the moment. It'd be great if everybody did what we thought they should do all the time, but that's just not the reality of a real life situation. So, so we're, we're happy, you know, from that spiritual perspective, we're happy for people to take our information and then do whatever they want to with that information. And the moment we start getting caught up in what they're not doing, that's a good reminder for us to come back to how invested am I in someone else taking my suggestions? Because now I'm operating from my ego, right? Now I just want to be right. And that's, they, they say in the Veda, that's the last barrier to liberation is you needing to be right. When you can transcend your need to be right, that's where you experience true freedom. And that's something, I think that, that's, that's like a lifetime worth of practice is transcending the need to be right. But then now you have that opportunity. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to indulge myself in this opportunity to go beyond my need to be right and to come back to my ability to hold two truths in my awareness at the same time. And that's how I'm engaging in my, in my spiritual practice. Okay. So all that to say, every, there's no thing that we're experiencing that's either all positive or all negative. And, and our opportunity in those moments, whether we're doing this with ourselves or whether we're doing this with other people is to entertain the idea that, hey, this, this situation might be a little more complex than we initially thought. And, um, and let's just, first of all, let's take some space to just be with that. Right? Take some space to just be with that. And that's where, again, your meditation practice comes in. When people say stuff like, go meditate on it. It doesn't necessarily mean go sit down and close your eyes and rehearse what happened and think about it from multiple angles because you're only able to think about a situation from the state of consciousness that put you in that situation. Einstein said that, not me. Einstein said that. He said he said you can't find a solution to a situation unless you expand your consciousness beyond the consciousness that you were in when you when you created the situation. And so meditation, what it does is it expands our awareness. That's all it does. It expands our awareness beyond where we were prior to sitting down and closing our eyes, right? In other words, it helps to break down that hard wiring of what we are more or less expecting to happen in life. And it expands our awareness of the possibilities. So we can hold even more truths in our awareness at the same time. 
Instead of just two or three, maybe we can hold five or six different truths in our awareness at the same time. And we can be aware of what our spirit wants us to do next. Because we have a spiritual, um, we'll call it GPS, right? If you, if you operate under the belief that we're here to grow spiritually and, you know, there's what, 8 billion people on the planet, which means there are 8 billion individual spiritual agendas for being here on this planet, right? So you have some people who are in some, who, what, they appear to be in some very lofty life situations, you know, living in mansions and fraternizing with celebrities and doing all this kind of fun stuff. And they have trust funds and endowments and all kinds of, you know, million, billion dollar estates. We may look at those people and say, oh, they're so well off. They, you know, don't have any worries because they have all this money. And then there's other people who live in, in these you know, more underdeveloped places in the world who are, you know, what some people may consider to be operating in squalor and they have, you know, they have uh, plastic soda bottles turned into flip flops and hand me down clothes and they're sitting on the floor eating and going to an outhouse to use the bathroom and, you know, they're sleeping five, six to a room and this kind of thing. And we may look at them and go, oh, wow, they have such bad luck in life. But from a spiritual perspective, everybody, no matter what your situation is, everybody's getting exactly what they need in order to grow and develop, develop spiritually. So we are born into these various circumstances and then we have our spiritual DNA, which, which is constantly nudging us and guiding us into different relationships and different um, work opportunities. And we think on the surface, oh, this is happening for me to make money or this is happening for me to have kids or this is happening so I can keep up with the rest of societal expectations. But on a deeper level, it's happening so that you can learn how to love. It's happening so that you can learn forgiveness. It's happening so that you can transcend um, feeling abandoned, right? Or any other, you know, however many millions of spiritual lessons that one can learn. And I've equated it in the past to watching Netflix. We've all had the experience where you go to a streaming service to watch a film and there's like a million different options, but yet you find yourself paralyzed by all the different options. You don't know what to watch. Oh, I've seen this before. I don't really feel like seeing an action movie right now. Uh, I don't know. Stand-up comedy seems kind of boring, right? And you're just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, and then you end up feeling like, ah, let's do something else. I don't really see anything good on Netflix. Out of, mil <laughs> out of millions of different options. And that's because you've been there done that. So the idea of watching another Denzel Washington movie or watching another romantic comedy just isn't that interesting to you at that point in time, right? And the same thing happens spiritually. Being in the mansion, ah, I've done that before. Having all this money, ah, you know, I've done that before too. But what about living in India and living in, you know, three, uh, eight to a room and driving a rickshaw, huh, that's kind of interesting. I haven't had that experience yet. And that explains from a spiritual perspective why people are in different situations and we're all here to get what we need. And so the idea for that person who may have, who may have come into that lifetime in order to become closer to um, their spiritual practice in that lifetime wanted to be in the part of the world that prioritizes spirituality. You know, you wouldn't be in Beverly Hills if you wanted to prioritize spirituality. If you want to prioritize materialism, perhaps, then you'd be in a place like Beverly Hills and play that experience out. So, but the person who's in that Beverly Hills life, right, may have chosen that life because um, 
people are going to be coming after them for their money and they want to learn more about unconditional love. Or they may lose all of their money in some bad investment and they want to see who they are beyond their material possessions. And, and so that's what the setup to their life happens to be. So all these things are happening and on the surface, it's the farmer and the plow horse. Oh, that's good. That's bad. That's good. That's bad. But on a spiritual level, again, it's a lot more nuanced than that because yes, a bad thing happened. Yes, a painful thing happened. Yes, ex uh, suffering is being experienced. And at the same time, there's an opportunity there to learn a spiritual lesson, the one that you came here to learn. And a really good clue into what your spiritual lesson happens to be is you continue to have repeated bad things happen, but in different scenarios. So, you know, somebody may be experiencing abandonment in a work context, in a relationship context, in a familial context, in a friendship context. People keep running away from you and you don't understand why. Why do people keep you know, leaving me high and dry in all these different situations. Well, that's an indication that maybe you are here to learn how to rebound from feeling abandoned and to come back to yourself. Or maybe you're here to learn how to establish healthier boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever the lesson is, it's not anyone else's job to tell you what that is. That's your job to decipher for yourself based on what you're feeling deep down inside. But in order to do that, you have to give yourself the time and the space to explore within. And again, that's where your inner practices come in very, very handy. You sit down and you do your meditation, you expand your awareness, and your awareness takes you beyond just what's happening at the surface. And it exposes you to what you're also feeling deep down within. So then your ability to hold those multiple truths becomes greater and greater. Okay. And then what happens is when you start to come into contact with situations that normally you would have described as toxic positivity, you have a greater awareness to be able to decipher, okay, yeah, I could see how people would say that about this situation. And there's some usefulness in what this person is saying, right? So you can, your ability to extract the usefulness from these various situations gets greater and greater and greater. And, and your ability to leave behind the nonsense or what you don't find to be particularly useful also gets greater and greater. And this is a very powerful way to move through life because what it means is that you can now find usefulness in almost any situation at any time. And you don't have to be distracted by judging the situation as toxically this or toxically that, right? But other people may look at you and go, oh, they're toxic, toxically positive all the time, merely because they haven't yet done that same degree of work that allows them to see the nuances in a given situation. And here's another thing that, you know, even scientists are starting to acknowledge even way back in the 1950s and 60s is that there's this thing called the placebo effect, which is to say that when you believe that something is true, about 40% of the time it becomes true. And the most the way that they study the placebo effect is they would create uh, medication that was made out of water or sugar and didn't have any inherent medicinal effects, but they would tell a patient that this medication is the thing that's going to numb your pain or it's going to solve whatever physical problem you happen to be experiencing. And four out of 10 people who received this sugar pill would have the same medicinal effects as the people who receive the actual medication. 
which is pretty impressive. And what it reveals is that there's something about believing wholeheartedly that something is the case that causes it to have a heightened level of efficacy, right? Compared to the actual thing, which is pretty impressive. So it reveals that being positive, even though there may not be hard evidence that there's something, quotes, good happening as a result of the horse running away, can lead to a beneficial outcome or whatever the expected outcome um, could be. But at the same time, it also means that when we're, quote, realistic and being negative and focusing on all the worst things that could happen as a result of this, we can also end up manifesting those conditions as well. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way, I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. I was reading an article this morning about, this is in the New York Times. It's about this teenager who died of leukemia at 14 years old. He was Italian. His name is Carlo Acutis. He's going to become the first millennial saint. So the Pope and all these people in, 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 in the Vatican are going through the various protocols to make this guy, Carlo, a saint. And the reason why is because he had such belief in the power of miracles that he created this website documenting faith-based miracles, meaning miracles that didn't have any sort of scientific backing to explain why they happened. And when he passed away, people who prayed to him in Italy began to also experience miracles that defied science. And people who went to his grave would experience miracles that defied science. And this happened so often that um, they, they, they decided, hey, we need to make this, this kid uh, our first millennial saint. And that's, that's, again, we can make the argument that is a byproduct of this idea of the placebo effect, just thinking that something is the case. I'm not suggesting that miracles aren't real or are real, right? It depends on what we even define as a miracle. But somebody once said, in order to see a miracle, you have to believe in miracles. And so if you believe that that is the case, then what the science says is that 40% of the time you're going to experience a miracle, right? Which is pretty remarkable, but a miracle could be, I want to go take a training and it's going to cost X amount of money and I don't have X amount of money. And then all of a sudden I'm in a situation where I have that money and I didn't, I didn't foresee that situation happening. Like one of my favorite movies, It's a Wonderful Life, which is a Christmas movie. I'm not going to get into the whole plot, but basically the main character um, ends up losing a bunch of money and it looks like he's going to go to jail at the end of the movie. And his wife goes out and because this guy, is, he's such a good guy and he's been such a benefit to the community, she goes out and she basically crowdfunds the, more, than, more than the amount of money that the guy lost. And in the final hour, she comes back with this big bucket of money and ends up saving the day. And, you know, it's a Christmas movie. So he calls it, oh, this is a Christmas miracle, right? But that kind of thing can happen. Just believing that something is possible doesn't necessarily mean that we have to know how it's going to happen, right? If for those of you who read the book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, you know it's about uh, Victor Frankl, who is a concentration camp survivor, who said that one of the ways that he was able to survive and that he observed other people uh, surviving is they adopted a purpose. They adopted a why. They had a reason for surviving. 
And oftentimes this reason was something that they manufactured for themselves. It wasn't something that they were assigned. It's something that they created for themselves. And he ended up coining this, this phrase, and maybe it was a Nietzsche phrase that he he quoted, but uh, it says, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how, right? He who has a why to live can bear almost any how. And, you know, they were, uh, they were, they were exposed to the most extreme of circumstances, physical, mental, and otherwise in those concentration camps where anybody in their rational mind would have been broken, would have given up, would have even committed suicide if they could just to get out of the suffering that they were experiencing in those concentration camps. But his whole thing was, you know, he wrote this book while he was in the concentration camp. And obviously he had to, you know, employ so many tactics to be able to get, preserve the book because they weren't, the Nazis weren't a big fan of, you know, people walking around with manuscripts. So he had to write it in secret, et cetera, et cetera. And, and some, to some extent, memorize those details. But that was one of his whys. That was one of his whys. Other people may have a why if I want to see my family again. I want to live to see my family again. And so that's also a powerful protocol that we can adopt in the spiritual parlance. We call it having a life purpose or believing that life is happening for you and not just to you or believing that everything happens for a reason, right? Or believing in karma, which is, you know, things that go around, come around just as a simple interpretation of that. And so one of the things that I have been writing about and encouraging people to do is to adopt beliefs that empower you the most, right? Because people can hear about these terms, karma, dharma, life purpose, and they go, oh, there's no scientific evidence that proves that there's such a thing as dharma or karma or that you have a life purpose. We're just like beetles. We're just like, you know, raccoons. We come here, we procreate, we protect our territory, we fight off predators, you know, and we do, we're just animals and we just do what other animals do. And yes, you can make the argument for that, right? That's a truth that we can hold in our awareness. And at the same time, what makes us unique as humans is we do have the power to adopt other beliefs, right? A raccoon can't say, hey, I've got a life purpose. My life purpose is to, you know, build this nest and make sure that I take care of other raccoons and da 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 or my life purpose is to study ants, <laughs> right? Other animals can't do that as far as we know, but we can. And the fact that we can gives us access to that placebo effect, which again has been proven to be at least 40% effective, which means that in some cases it was 90% effective. It was hundred percent effective. In other cases, it was 10% effective. It was 8% effective, but the average was 40% effective. And because we have this ability, we may as well use it to adopt belief systems that can't be proved one way or the other, but it does allow us to tap into that placebo effect. And when we do that, then we may benefit in a situation that, that most, that 60% of people haven't benefited from. We could be in that 40%. And that could be enough to get us through that experience to allow us to learn whatever lesson we went through that experience to learn. And, and, and it helps to keep us where we need to be in order to show up for the next lesson, which is somewhere in the present moment, right? I talked earlier in this episode about, you know, how when you are under the influence of stress, it puts you into some sort of mental health, you know, challenge. If it can, if it perpetuates, you end up with low grade anxiety or circumstantial depression or, you know, things like that. And when you're experiencing those, you're not in the present moment. You're not in the present moment. You're somewhere in the past. Maybe you're worried about something that's going to happen in the future, which means you don't have access to the full repertoire of your ability to hold those multiple truths in your awareness at the same time 
mostly what you are able to perceive are dangers. It's what's not happening. You aren't able to perceive what is happening. And you can read a book about it. It doesn't matter because your default, your hard wiring is always going to go back to what's not happening. So you and you alone are responsible for turning that around, for opening up your awareness, for taking Einstein's advice and saying you have to expand your consciousness beyond whatever got you into this situation. And that's where your inner work is mandatory. And that's why I'm such a big proponent of inner work. It's not because you know, it's something you can brag about. It's something that can help you in a real world way in a moment to moment basis with expanding your awareness, with uh, being able to hold those multiple truths at the same time without being distracted. And so inner work includes practices like daily meditation, like, you know, thinking of 10 or 15 things you're grateful for on a regular basis, like being of service, taking on a service project, um, that allows you to help other people to think about the experiences of other people beyond yourself. For me, what that looks like is, you know, I write this daily dose of inspiration email. That's the current iteration of my service project. Something that I do for free, meaning I don't get paid on the front end to do that. Sure. You can make the argument that I get people registering for my courses and whatnot as a result of being on my email list. But even those courses are all geared around helping people, right? And the money that I make helps me create the infrastructure, just like those media publications. You know, you, there's always infrastructure and people need to get paid. So, so that's a part of the equation as well, but it's all in service to, to helping people. And we want to um, create some aspect of that for ourselves at all times. And that, that will help to not only uh, expand your awareness beyond yourself, but it also, I consider that to also be my health insurance. And this is another kind of an unexpected benefit that I found because I've been actively and consciously putting myself in the service position for many, many years. I would say probably for um, 20 years now in a conscious, intentional way. And as a result, I don't really get sick. I mean, yes, I get an occasional cold. Yes, I get an occasional headache. Yes, I get an occasional sore throat. But I don't ever get sick enough that I can't do the things that I'm here to do. So I this is a whole other topic. Maybe we'll do a whole other uh, solo episode on this. But I, I consider my service work to be like my health insurance, my real health insurance, right? The other stuff that you may pay on a monthly basis is kind of like your hospital insurance or your accident coverage, but your real health insurance is, are you operating in alignment with a bigger purpose than just paying your bills, just making yourself comfortable, just taking care of yourself on a regular basis? Are you using your resources to help other people in some way, in some capacity that feels aligned with you, that incorporates many of the experiences that you've, you've had in your, in your past and that is useful, that is useful for other people, that's useful for the world? And if so, then you are also, my prediction is you're never, you're not going to find yourself um, being compromised physically or even psychologically to the point where you're impaired from being able to do that service project. You're always going to have the resources, the awareness, the health, everything you need in order to perform that project in order to show up for your purpose. And so that comes as the, in the basic support package with being on your purpose. Okay. And again, maybe this is a placebo. I don't know, but I don't care if it keeps me healthy, knock on wood. I don't care if it's a placebo. I don't care if it's a real thing. Again, I could completely be making this up, but if I believe in it strongly enough, then 40% of the time it is going to work. And so far for these 20 years, it has worked beautifully. And I'm going to keep doing that. I'm going to keep adopting beliefs that I feel support me. And I strongly encourage you to do the same. And so 
Bottom line here is that's why I am a big supporter of positivity. I do not condone invalidating other people's experiences, um, which I think is where it gets to be in the toxic category of positivity. But I also don't condone apologizing for feeling optimistic for yourself and or for others. I'm not saying that you should express that when you feel like expressing it, you need to have the awareness to know that, okay, this is not the right time or place to express this. For instance, if you get up to, to give a eulogy at a funeral, that may not be the place to talk about how, you know, death is not real and you're optimistic that they're going to incarnate into a beautiful life next time. And, you know, all this kind of stuff, even though that's may, that may be something you believe in your heart of hearts, that may be the place to reflect on a positive experience that you have with that person in their past, right? Because that's what is going to be useful for that moment. And then privately, privately, you can entertain the idea that, yes, you know, there's no such thing as death. And the cancer that the person suffered from um, was teaching them, you know, some powerful spiritual lessons, et cetera, et cetera. That's not something that you need to talk, get up and talk about publicly. And being able to discern between those two things is something that you will benefit from with your daily spiritual practices, because you will have not just empathy with the person who passed away, but you'll also have empathy with the people who are there who may not be in the same sort of mindset, heart set, spiritual set that you may be experiencing at that moment in time, but maybe they're moving in that direction, right? And so, you know, if you have someone who's in, thir in, in, in third grade and you're a PhD student working on your doctorate in, in quantum mechanics and the third grader is just learning multiplication, right? You don't go to the third grade, third grade math class and start talking about quantum mechanics and how two and two, two plus two actually is eight, because that's just going to end up bewildering everybody. And no one's going to understand what you're talking about, nor are they going to care what you're talking about. And you're probably going to put everybody off. So instead, just understand that where people are is where they need to be for the progression of their own evolutionary expansion of awareness. And the belief systems that they have right now are going to somehow lead to a more expansive belief, either through maybe a positive experience or maybe it'll be through a so-called negative experience. And both are equally useful for spiritual evolution. And that's where we want to be with ourselves as well. When we're going through an experience that we consider to be positive and or negative, it's going to lead to something, some greater awareness at some point down the line. And just, again, just being patient with ourselves and holding the space for that to happen and to unfold in its own unique way is a part of the spiritual practice. It's about being, what I said earlier, process-oriented as opposed to being outcome-oriented. And, you know, getting online and debating about toxic positivity and spiritual bypassing, it's hopefully you've evolved beyond that point. You don't have to really do that because you have more important things to attend to, such as being of service to other people in, in useful ways, in ways that are being more empathetic and less combative, less destructive. Trust there are going to be plenty of people who are willing to spend their precious time debating about what's toxic and what's not toxic. And for you, um, spend your time asking yourself, how can I be of more use in positive ways, in constructive ways, in inspiring ways and motivational ways that can reach the most amount of people um, and, and also allow me to be the most authentic to myself. So just want to leave you with that thought. And if you haven't doubled down on your commitment to your inner work, um, don't delay that either because the quicker you, you do that, the quicker you start to embody those principles and that awareness that allows how you move through the world to become more relatable to other people, more realistic, and therefore more useful to the most amount of people, right? 
So you don't have to get in there and explain that you're giving them a spiritual solution. They conclude that, oh, this sounds like or feels like a spiritual solution, right? Just based on who you are, just based on how you show up, just based on how you speak. If you have to get in there and, and explain that this is a spiritual solution, then it's not really a spiritual solution yet. It's still in process. The apple, the wheel is still spinning, so to speak. All right. Hopefully you found this helpful. Um, I've got a few other solo episodes, which are a little bit different from my interview episodes where I'm talking to guests about finding their purpose. I like to use these episodes as just a primer for helping you, again, develop the skill sets that you are going to be relying upon uh, from the inside out so that you can you can have a greater chance of finding your purpose sooner rather than later. And, um, and, and by the way, my idea of purpose is you're already living your purpose. You just may not be aware of it yet. So, uh, getting to the point where you are aware that everything that you're experiencing, everything that you've gone through so far is a part of your purpose. It's a part of your path. It's helping to set the scene for you to become the best version of yourself, the highest version of yourself. All right. Hope you found it helpful. And thanks again for tuning in to my solo episode. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.